last week, but I thought, yeah, anyway, Ezekiel is getting a little trouble. You never know. begin with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this new day, and we thank you for the chance to be together and continue our journey through the book of Ezekiel. Pray, Lord, that you would bless us with insight, that you would open the eyes of our heart, and that you would teach us to, to love you and to grow in you. So hear our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. <coughs> Some quick review so we know what we're talking about. Um, Ezekiel was a prophet who was taken out of Jerusalem and exiled in Babylon before the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem. And Ezekiel, there are a lot of vivid, and Ezekiel is a very dramatic book, and we've been seeing that. And this book is not, we're going to see this today. This is a, today's, we've had some, we've had some, we've had a lot of dramatic stories so far, but today's story, if you begin to understand what's going on, it's, it's really challenging emotionally. So we're in chapter 24. In the ninth year, in the 10th month, on the 10th day, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, record this day, this very date, because the king of Babylon has laid siege to Jerusalem this very day. Tell this rebellious people a parable and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Put on the cooking pot. Put it on and pour water in it. Put, it, uh, put into it the pieces of meat, all the choicest pieces, the leg and the shoulder. Fill it with the best of, the, of these bones, take the pick of the flock, pile wood beneath it for the bones, bring it to a boil, and cook the bones in it. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says, Woe to the city of bloodshed, to the pot now encrusted, whose deposit will not go away. Take the meat out piece by piece in whatever order it comes. For the blood she shed in her midst, she poured out on bare rocks. She did not pour it on the ground where the dust would cover it. To stir up wrath and to take revenge, I put her blood on, I put her blood on bare rocks so that it would not be covered. Okay, this probably seems, what on earth is this saying? Why are we talking about cooking a pot of meat? Now, if you remember way back, you might remember we've been talking about pots and cooking before with Ezekiel. He early in the book he was told, well, he made this little he made this little map. Gotta throw these away. He made this little map of Jerusalem before, earlier in the book. If you remember that. And then he put it in a big pot. And, and that was like an iron wall. So, so we've had a lot of things, we've had a lot of things with, with pots and cooking in this story. Now, the first thing he says to Ezekiel is something has happened, so record the state. What's happening? Babylon is laying siege to, to Jerusalem. Emotionally, what does this mean to the exiles in Babylon? Where does their heart lie? Back in Jerusalem. Back in Jerusalem. Now, if, if, for example, there's, if you have friends in San Francisco and you hear about a big earthquake in San Francisco, what does your heart do? That's right. You love your friends. If, let's say, you grew up in another place and you live out here and you hear that some 
calamity has happened to your hometown, what does that do to your heart? Well, you wonder who got hurt or killed. That's right. So now, even, so you've got all of those dynamics, but also remember the plot of the Bible. So here again is the Genesis 1 representation, God in his temple, and the story of the Bible, the story of the Bible begins in the garden with Adam and Eve, and in Genesis 2 they walk with God, but then something happens. What happens in the garden? Okay, they fall into temptation. And now, now again, this is it's it's really important for us to kind of understand the garden is and, and that word the wording is intentionally chosen. It's not the field of Eden, it's not the land of Eden, it's the garden of Eden, because in the book of Genesis, this is well, what is a, a garden is usually connected to something else. A person. A person. But also, <laughs> if, if I talk to you about the gardens of Versailles, what is Versailles? The, uh, the armistice. Well, you think of the armistice with World War I, but it's, it's the... City. It's a big museum. It's a palace. Yeah, yeah. Louis XIV, I think it was Louis XIV, made this enormous, glorious, beautiful palace. Now, Louis XVI was overthrown, and he had the French Revolution, but we still have the great palace of Versailles because it's such a magnificent building, and it has gardens. And the reason it has gardens is because, well, even the White House has the Rose Garden. And if you remember back in the Nixon days, um, you know, there was a wedding in the Rose Garden for one of Richard Nixon's daughters. And so palaces, well, who lives in palaces? Kings. Palaces have gardens. Nebuchadnezzar had the hanging gardens of Babylon, where he had a wife and she was from the mountains and Babylon is in a floodplain like Sacramento and she missed the mountains. So King Nebuchadnezzar built her a mountain garden so, and in the garden there would be trees, fruit trees, and animals, and, and so when we read about the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 2, what we so often jump over is that this is a royal garden, and when we read that the Lord walked in the garden in the cool of the day, if you're the king living in Versailles, at the end of the day when you're done work, you walk in your garden to relax and enjoy it, and that makes the man and the woman what? Caretakers of the garden. They are the gardeners. Adam has to name the animals. They be fruitful and multiply. This is what they're doing in the garden. But then the man and the woman do decide what in the garden? They're better caretakers. That, that's right. I mean, you, could, you couldn't imagine someone, we read Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel, you couldn't imagine some Nebuchadnezzar's gardener saying to him, I want to take this garden in a different way. I don't care what you think. If you'd say that to Nebuchadnezzar, what would Nebuchadnezzar do? Have your <laughs> it wouldn't take 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> you just don't do that. But so then, you know, the snake and the tree and all of that, and then the curses, and then they are exiled from the garden. And basically means heaven and earth are cut off, okay? That's how the story of the Bible starts. And then, actually, at 11 o'clock, we're going to talk about the flood, where things down here are so bad, God regrets having made it, and so he says, I'm going to wipe it out again. And so the waters above and the waters below wash away the earth, but God saves Noah. And But then the Tower of Babel, they try to build a tower to where? Heaven. Well, why do they want to get to heaven? Because heaven controls earth. They're trying to... The Tower of Babel is, in a sense, another story of rebellion, 
But now there's lots more of them, and they have organization and technology, and now they're going to make an assault on God. And how does God foil their plan? Jesus, the language. That's right. Now they can't work together, and now they have to do what God desired for them to do, even if they don't want to. So, so you have this whole story going on. So then we get to Israel. Israel was to be, and I'm going to talk about this in the sermon today too, a nation of priests. Well, what does that mean? That means that Israel was going to connect, once again, heaven and earth. And the temple in Jerusalem was, in a sense, the embassy of the temple in heaven. And the idea was that Israel was to display to the world who God is, and then the nations would come to Israel. That's the project. But how did Israel do with her mission? Fail. Fail. In fact, the problem was that God had given Israel his name, his reputation, and Israel was destroying his reputation among the nations, which is exactly opposite of what was intended to happen. Israel was supposed to display God's glory, but all that Israel displayed was human brokenness. And so this is, this is the story. And so all of these chapters in Ezekiel have been God's anger and what Israel has done with the mission God had given her. Okay? So now, Jerusalem is under siege. And so the people are worried about their friends that are there. The people are worried about their hometown that is there. And they're also worried that their entire identity was bound up in this. And if Jerusalem and the temple are destroyed, the whole project is done. And, oh, go ahead, Maureen. Is there any significance to the 10th day of the 10th month? The date actually here, there's a huge debate because there's, we have dates from Jeremiah and dates from the other book. And so there's a huge debate in the scholarship about the way Ezekiel records the date. And I, I think you're exactly right, Lord. When you read the 10th day of the 10th month, that's too, it, it's too clearly symbolic to ignore. Because 10 for Hebrews is a day of fullness. And so what happened with them, you know, if you look in the book of Revelation, for example, the 144,000, well, that's 12 times 12 times 1,000. 1,000 is a number of fullness. Well, 10 times 10 times 10. And, and so I think, more you're right in that 10th day of the 10th month, this is communicating fullness of time that God has now basically lost his patience, time has come, and, and this is what's going to be hard about this passage, condemnation is now in Jerusalem. So now what the scholars do is try and figure out, well, how does this coordinate? Because they've got a really good idea about the date in our terms of when this was. So then we have our timing versus Ezekiel's timing, and they're trying to figure out the relationship of those two. So there's a there's a lot of debate about Ezekiel versus Jeremiah. Does that matter? Not to us, but scholars pay attention to minutia. And so and when you see a discrepancy like that, I mean I mean, Maury is, Maury is right. The ninth year, the tenth month on the tenth day. If you read the Bible and you look at those numbers, they just jump out. And you, you would say, I mean, for us, for the most part, numbers are just kind of numbers. 
But we know for the Hebrews, numbers had symbolic significance. And so when you see numbers like this, you begin to say, huh, well then you start doing this research. So, but, but the idea is that, oh, God is going to bring judgment. And so put on the cooking pot. Now we've had a lot of talk about cooking pots. And Jerusalem has been portrayed numerous times in the book as a pot or in a pot. And so put out the cooking pot, pour water in it, put in the, piece, the, the pieces of meat and all the choice pieces. And so, well, last night I went to an event in San Francisco and there were a number, you'd bump into other people from Sacramento there and people from Sacramento would say things that praised Sacramento. Because when it, you come from your hometown, you usually say, you're usually proud about where you come from. And, you know, all the best people come from New Jersey. Right, Marty? <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know them anymore. <laughs> so, and so the story begins and you have this cooking pot and it's the choices, the choicest pieces go in there. And so you're kind of imagining that what's going to come forth from this cooking pot is the best food. So that's how the story starts. And so you put the, the choicest cuts of meat in it, and you put the best bones in it, and you take the pick of the flock and you put that in, and you put wood beneath it for the bones, and you bring it to a boil, and you cook it up. But now what we find, so that's, Verses 3 through 5. Now suddenly, and again, if you remember the, the parable of the vineyard, so many, so often in the prophets, the, the, the stories take this, take this tack that the story begins, you're anticipating glory, you're anticipating something good. But, and this is a little obscure in the text, um, the, it, what seems to be happening here is that the assumption is that the pot is bad. Now, if you had an iron pot, what's, what's the problem with, we have all these nice stainless steel pans and aluminum pans today. What's the problem with an iron pot? If you have an iron skillet and you don't take care of it, what happens? It rusts. It rusts. Now, let's imagine you put food in a rusty pot. What, what happens to your food? Yeah, good. <laughs> well, here's a question. What color, let's say you had a rusty pot and you'd put meat and you'd put water in it, what would the color of the soup start to look like? Yeah. Rusty. Which kind of looks like what? Blood. Blood. So, verse 6. Woe to the city of bloodshed, to the pot now encrusted, whose deposits will not go away. Israel is a rusty iron pot. Now, you know, we talked about this, this mission. Um, so let's think about the let's think about the flood story. You get to Genesis chapter 5, and God looks around. And all he sees in his world is bloodshed. What do you think God, how do you think God feels about that? That's not the way it was intended to be. In fact, when does bloodshed start in the story of Genesis? Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. Brother against brother. And it goes out from there. And so... In terms of God's mission to display his glory to the world, do you imagine Jerusalem should be a city of bloodshed? No. It should be a city of justice. It should be a city of righteousness. Jerusalem should reflect God's original intention for the world. But Jerusalem doesn't. It's a city of corruption. It's a city of bloodshed. Now, we live in an extraordinarily, and I know it's hard for us to imagine this, but we have to 
not compare our situation to an ideal world, but compare our situation to what life is like in a lot of other countries and what life has been like over history. Welcome. Hi. Are you Adam? I am Adam. Adam, welcome. Good to meet you. Good to meet you. Thanks for coming. Have a seat. Yeah. Now, let me, let, me get, let me tell you a little story. I was, as you know, I was a missionary in the Dominican Republic, and you drive down the road, and police would be, police and soldiers would be standing by the side of the road, and they would pull you over. Now, you didn't have a lot of police cars. Here in the States, you know, the police cars, they might pull you over. In the Dominican Republic, they always pulled you over. And then they'd pull you over, and everybody understood why they pulled you over. Any idea why they pull you over? Right. That's right. And so, you know, if, if you knew this would happen, so you keep a few pesos around, and, and basically what you learn to do, you know, I don't know if you should go around saying, my pastor knows how to give bribes. Um, you know, you just put a few pesos there in the palm of your hand, and when you shake the cop's hand, you know, and he just says, go on your way. It's kind of like a toll. Um, so I was working with Haitians in the Dominican Republic. And so you'd have these military checkpoints. And, and you'll see this down in Arizona where you'll have checkpoints to look for illegals. Well, a lot of the Haitians were illegal. And so basically the soldiers were horribly underpaid. And in fact, Balaguer, who was one of the, um, so there used to be a, there used to be a dictator named Trujillo and one of his right-hand men were Balaguer after Trujillo was overthrown and dead. Balaguer became the president, and Balaguer actually publicly said to the public employees, I know we don't pay you much, so you just kind of have to make it up as you go along. And everybody understood what that meant. So the president of the country basically says, well, you know, bribery is just the way we pay our public employees. Now, what does that do to justice? Now, I'm not saying that there isn't corruption and injustice here, but it's different, okay? And it's not as sanctioned, in a sense. So one day, I get, because I worked with Haitians, part of the reason the Haitians wanted me, because I was white, and because I was an American. Because what would happen was, they'd get shaken down by the Dominicans, but then the pastors would call me, and say, Pastor, one of my members has been taken into custody over by the military. So then I show up. See, if they just grab a Haitian, but here I show up. Now, what is the military starting to think? Ooh, this Haitian has connections. And he's an American. He might, he might know people from America's Watch because America's Watch keeps writing articles about how poorly Haitians are being treated in the Dominican Republic, that puts pressure on the government, that influences the U.S. government. They don't want that kind of press. So one day, this Haitian had a camera, and he was pulled over by the military, and he was, he was, his hand, and so the military saw, oh, you got a camera. I'll take that. And off he goes. So, the guy calls his pastor, pastor calls me, me and the guy and the pastor go down to the military, you know, the, the military fort. And of course I show up and the commandant is like, oh, well, you know, welcome, man. So then I explain to the commandant what happened. He's like, oh, this is terrible. This should never take place. And so he lines up the soldiers that he knew were running that checkpoint and, um, and he, you know, so then in front of me and in front of the Haitians and the pastor, he's, you know, how horrible that you did this. And, and I'll tell you what, he tells to the soldiers, I'll tell you what, if the person who was guilty of this comes forward and gives up the camera, there'll be no punishment. And so the soldier comes forward, gives up the camera. And the commandant leans over to me and says, I'm going to punish him anyway. Okay, that's small stuff. Through most of the world, in most of human history, 
if you disrespect the king, what happens to you? That's right. They don't have freedom of speech. You can't, you know, you can't go out and, you know, give the king the finger or yell at him or you can't do any of those kind of things because you get killed. Now, the Lord says of Jerusalem, she's a city of bloodshed. And if you remember the stories that we're going through in, in First and Second Kings, you know, um, King Ahab saw Naboth's field and he wanted it and he's crying like a little boy in his bed because he can't have it because the law of the Lord says that belongs to Naboth and the king can't just grab it. And, and so Jezebel, Naboth's Syrian wife from Tyre and Sidon, a Sidonian wife, comes to him and says, what's wrong with you? You're the king. Trump up some charges against him. Get him stoned for blasphemy and take his vineyard so you can have your vegetable garden. And that's what Ahab does. Now that's Samaria. The Lord is saying Jerusalem is the city of bloodshed because this is how this is human corruption. And again, the mission of Israel is for her to be different. This ought not to happen in Jerusalem. And the Lord says, I've attached my name to this. And so when you are like everyone else, and my name is attached to you, you make my name bad. You know, and it's like a parent with a child. You know, kid goes to school, the kid's you know, not behaving properly and cutting up, and then the note comes home. The bad parent, when the pet, when the parent gets the note, does what? Throws it away. That's one way to be bad. Beats the kid. Well, at least the parent who beats the kid has an idea that maybe there should be some discipline, but the parent doesn't have an idea about how to properly discipline. The good parent says to the child, when you go to that school, to a certain degree, you represent me and the family. So, um, you know, let's let's not be doing this. You know, represent us well. So my, my poor kids, so Benny, Josie, and Maddie all went to McClatchy, and Maddie was a good student. So then when Josie, they're all good students, then when Josie came into the class, the teacher's like, oh, you're Maddie's sister. And Josie's like, oh, no, I've got a reputation to uphold. And then when Ben came in, oh, you're, you're Maddie and Josie's brother. So Maddie's like, oh, I've got, because nobody else, there's no other Vander Clays in the school, so the name is easy to spot. But, you know, it's this reputation thing. And so God basically gets to the point of saying, for hundreds of years, I've been sending my prophets to you saying, this is your mission. This is your identity. This is what I'm calling you to do. But I am done now and I am going to bring destruction on the city. And, you know, over past lessons that we've looked at this, there's lots of layers to this because everyone expected, no God, it's your job to protect us. That would be like the kid who got the no coming home and saying, Mom, you're supposed to go to school and protect me. And Mom would say, if I thought they were lying about you, I would protect you. But if you really did what the note says you've done, you deserve to be punished. And I'm not going to protect you from the punishment because you need to learn. And so, verse 6, Woe to the city of bloodshed, the pot now encrusted, whose deposits will not go away. So this rusty pot, the Lord is saying, I can't clean the pot. Take the meat out piece by piece in whatever order it comes because good meat that went in is now what? Spoiled. Jerusalem, you think you're the top of the world, but you're no better than anyone else. And because of your connection with me, 
It's not good enough for you to be no better than anyone else. And again, every good parent knows this. The parent sends their child to school and, you know, you get a, a note comes home that you've done something wrong and the kid says, well, what does the kid say? Well, I didn't do it. Or another excuse, everyone else was doing it too. And what does the good parent say to that excuse? Exactly. You're not everyone else. <laughs> you go to school. I gave you my name. In fact, I even gave you your name. <laughs> so when you go to that school, I expect you to behave. I expect you, I mean, and again, not all parents do this, but don't all of us know that good parents do this? Why do good parents do that? Yes. They are doing something with their child to bring their child up, that, that their child will become an adult who does this too. Well, why is it important that the, the, the next generation does this too. And why do we want everyone to do this? Well, then the whole system works, right? Because if the school is sending home notes because kids aren't behaving themselves and there's nothing going on at home, at some point the school just says, we can't do anything. And then the, parent, the child gets expelled or sent to a special school, which is probably the next step on to, you know, a life of incarceration. <laughs> So, so this is all, and God is saying, you're a, you're a rusty pot, and I can't clean you. For the blood she, now this, this next section is a little complicated. For the blood she shed in her midst, she poured out on the bare rock. Now this, this to us doesn't make a lot of sense unless you look in the book of Leviticus, and, and you understand Again, some of the stuff we're going to be talking at 11 o'clock gets into this. So the, the flood story goes like this. God, in a sense, drowns the world. And then after the flood, God gives a rainbow as a sign of covenant. We're going to talk a lot about covenant at the 11 o'clock service. But one of the rules that God gives is, now after the flood, you don't have to just be vegetarians. You can eat the animals too. But when you eat the animals, drain the blood out of it because lifeblood belongs to me. Now we hear that and we think, oh, that sounds weird. What, what, any ideas what might be going on? I mean, they kept their custom ceremonial laws. Well, it's, it's, what's, what's helpful to try and understand is what's kind of in the cultural imagination behind the blood. Now, let's look at this in a very um, common sense way. If, okay, if, if you attack someone with a sword or a knife and you stab them, what happens? Very literally. You bleed. You bleed. And if you don't stop the bleeding, what happens? Yeah. Now, if, if this is the world you know, what's kind of an easy thing to connect? Life and blood. Life and blood. As long as the blood is in my body, you now you put a knife in me, and my blood drains out, you lose your life. You lose your life. And so there's this, there's this symbolic connection between life and blood. And so God tells Noah and his sons, okay, now you can eat any of the animals. And, but the only thing is, I don't want you to eat the blood. Now, this is interesting. Now, again, we think about this medically and you think, well, meat, blood, blah, blah, blah. But the purpose here isn't medical, it's symbolic. Why would God tell them to not eat the blood? and to let the blood drain into the ground. That's right. He's talking about human death at the same time. He first says, you may not kill another human being. Then he says, you may kill animals, but you may not eat the blood. Okay. 
Because in a sense, he's saying, you are, if you remember the Genesis story, God is saying, I am the king. You are in the Garden of Eden. You are my, what? You are my subjects. You are my servants. But now beneath, so you have God, and you have humanity. And beneath humanity, you have what? Animals. And plants. Now, what's really interesting, if you think about it this way, well, how do animals live? What do they eat? Plants. Okay, now humans, you may eat animals, but you may not kill other humans. So there's, there's a hierarchy that's established here. But now the blood, well, where do plants come from? So if you kill an animal to eat it, you may kill it, but the blood has to go into the ground. And, and symbolically, now if you read Genesis 1, it's really interesting because God, you know, you start with Tohu Wabohu in the great sea, and God names order into it. And then when you get to the chance, the, the place where the plants and the animals come from, if you read Genesis 1, it says, let the earth bring forth. It's very interesting. Often when we read that, we just kind of skip over that. So, so kind of the idea is that God, this is all of his domain, he, he works through the earth, and the earth brings forth the plants and the animals. A little animal. Um, and, well, now when you take the life of the animal... What should you do with the blood, which again, in their symbolic world, represents the life? Who owns the animal? God does. So you may eat the animal, but you must return the blood to the ground because it doesn't belong to you. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I never heard of that. <laughs> so, well, that's why you come to Sunday school, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> so life and death belong to God, not to man. Exactly. And, and so man may eat the animals, but the life belongs to God. Now here. For blood she shed in her midst. She poured out on bare rock. She did not pour it out on the ground where the dust would cover it. Also there you have the sense of with blood, well, what do you... From dust you are, to dust you will return. Again, this is kind of going God, you know, working the cycle here. Now, what happens if you put blood on bare rock? That's right. That's right. It'll dry. It'll stain. Now, now think this through. You kill someone. Well, think about even crucifixion. Why didn't... This is going to really get interesting. <laughs> when the Romans crucified people, they did it at the, the crossroads and the roads. Why? As an example. An example. You displayed it. Now, what was the message the Romans were giving in crucifixion? This all happened now. This is what will happen to you. Okay. They're taking the blood of their political enemies and they're pouring them out on the rocks. What are they doing? They're saying that this is basic human game. They're saying we are the masters here. If you cross us, we'll kill you. You see that blood? There's a story behind that blood. So now in terms of the symbolic world, what are the people saying? They're in charge. That's right. Life and death are in our hands. We decide who lives. We decide who dies. Isn't that the basis of every tyranny? 
I mean, every government, in a sense, even in our system, I mean, when Paul says in Romans 13, the Lord has given the state the power of the sword. Well, what does he mean by that? That's right. Now, now I'm not going to get too far into that because that whole thing gets complicated between individuals and states and we get into the book of Revelation and I mean, it, it all goes a lot of interesting places. But basically, just this little statement about pouring out blood on the bare rocks is a statement about what has happened in Jerusalem. That Jerusalem has, in a sense, said, now let's fast forward the story here to Jerusalem. This is supposed to be, they are supposed to reflect the will of God, but they don't. They've taken over the temple, and they've become lords of the earth, and they're not going to listen to the Lord of the earth. It's a retelling of the story of the Garden of Eden. And that's what Jerusalem has become. And the Lord says, I'm going to destroy it. And now this is the pattern in the Bible. Sodom and Gomorrah, Samaria, and in fact, Babylon in the book of Revelation. The city, it's Augustine saw this very clearly. There's the city of man and the city of God. Jerusalem was to be a representation of the city of God. But she became the city of man. Because in the city of man, this is how the system works. So David's great sin. David looks out, sees Bathsheba, wants her, takes her. Now, that was bad. What should he have done after that? Repented. Did he? Tried to hide it. Tried to hide it. And then he took that hiding, and then that led to what? Murder. Murder. That's the city of man. That's how we operate. My well-being at your expense. What was the job of the king? Protect the people. Be a shepherd of the people. All people. All people. <laughs> so, you know, this is what's going on here. So, for the blood she shed in her midst, she poured out on bare rocks. She did not pour it on the ground where the dust would cover it. To stir up my wrath and take my revenge, I put her blood on the bare rock so that it will not be covered. What is God saying? You think your big stuff, I am going to make your destruction. I'm going to do to you what you are doing to the world. Now, you might say, well, should God do that? Well, if he wants to. Well, that's the thing. He's got the right because who does the blood, the blood belong to? It belongs rightly to him. See, now, we never get through everything. Um, <laughs> That's all right. We'll be back next week. We'll be back next week. That's all right. But here's here's the amazing thing about the story is that God has every right to do this to Jerusalem, and He does it to Jerusalem. And in a sense, that addresses the rebellion, but that only gets us so far. Why? Let's say, you, let's say you read this story and you figure it out and you say, wow, I better follow God's law or God's going to punish me. But that's better than, I'm not going to listen to God. You know, that's an improvement. But, so the kid comes home from school with a, mark, with a, with a note about the wrong that the child has done. And the good parent punishes the child. And so things are, that's, that's a good story. Here's the problem. If the child simply fears the parent, let's talk about the case where the parent beats the kid up because he did wrong. What will the kid learn? 
That's how it's done. But if the kid is simply afraid of the parent, that's right. There's gonna there's gonna be a lot of other games that go on. And and then, then that also gets generation to generation. Well, my father beat me, so I'm gonna beat you. And, and the ideal relationship between the parent and child is a certain kind of fear, but is not being scared of. What kind of fear should the parent rightfully have, or should the child rightfully have to the parent? Love. Love and respect. Now, now the thing is, with this story, with God putting Israel's blood on the rocks, you get the message, watch out for God. He's not going to let things slip. And that might make you a very obedient and lawful person. But that's not the best relationship. So the story gets taken one further. Because here's the problem. Israel keeps messing up. She, she can't get her act together. And so God does what? Well, before he does that, he sends Jesus. He sends Jesus. And what does Jesus do? In a sense, God says to Jerusalem, "You, in injustice and violence, are shedding blood and putting it on the rocks to warn the world." I'm going to take your blood and put it on the rocks to show who's really boss. But that's only going to continue to perpetuate a culture of fear. Compliance out of fear. Now God says, I am going to send my son. Now again, you've got to think about the ancient world in terms of who and what a son is. I am going to send my son. Heir to everything that God has. Heir to everything that God has. And his blood is going to, in a sense, be on the rocks. His blood is going to be on a cross. Now, it's kind of a it's kind of a cliche when the parent leans the child over his knee and says, What? This is gonna hurt me more than it's gonna hurt you. And the kid kind of looks up and thinks, I don't quite buy that. <laughs> but if the parent is good, and you all, you know, if the parent is good, is that actually true? Why? Because it's pain. Because it's pain. And the parent does not want to strike the child because the parent loves the child. And the day the child realizes that the parent loves them, now maybe the child will go to school not and behave not because the child is afraid of the beating back home, but because the child willingly wants to represent the family in a good light. Well, now we're getting somewhere, aren't we? Now the thing is reversed. Okay. I'm going to put my three letters. <laughs> Misery, deliverance, gratitude. Misery. We are Jerusalem. We can't get our act together. Deliverance. God takes the additional step. He doesn't, he doesn't put... You know, you can put the perpetrator's blood on the rocks all day long, and maybe you'll get fear-based compliance. But when he sends his son, and when we see the love of the father, now suddenly we want to comply. Why? Because we're afraid? No. Because we love him. And, in fact... The good child, the good child looks up at the parent and says what? I want to be like you. And that motivates the behavior. Now suddenly, everything
it's different. So we'll have to talk more about 24 next week. <laughs> We're never going to get through this book. <laughs> Any questions or comments? I found that pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I literally have never heard it that way before. I found it interesting. Good. Good. Uh, Paul, I, I had a, a question, you know, it was from uh, <laughs> verse 32, right after verse 32, back in 23. Oh. <laughs> uh, you would drink your sister's cup, a cup yes. of large and deep. Would that go into a whole lot of uh, explaining on that? Well, not if you remember all of the other times drinking from a cup is mentioned in similar ways in the Bible, where Jesus talks about the cup he has to drink, and Jesus is meaning his crucifixion, and the cup, it's basically the cup full of the wrath of God. If you think about, this isn't in the Bible, but if you think about Socrates, Socrates is going to be killed by the um, the leaders of, of Athens because they're, they're sick to death of him. And he's given a cup of hemlock and he willingly drinks it knowing it's his death. And so this the cup in, in the Bible story is the cup of wrath. And so it's basically saying, you know, to Jerusalem, you saw what happened to Samaria? That's the cup you're going to have to drink from. And then in Jesus' story, a couple of the mother of a, you know, a couple of disciples, they want to they wanna be number one in the, in the hierarchy of disciples. And Jesus says to them, can you drink from my cup? Well, what does Jesus, what does Jesus do when he says that? What, how does Jesus change the hierarchy in the kingdom of God? What does it mean to be a leader? It means, well, people love to take charge when it means getting to order other people around. Well, what does being a leader mean in Jesus' economy? You're the servant of all. You suffer and die. It's, it's the king, you know, it's the king who, well, you have this, again, great in the story of Saul, David, and Goliath. So when Saul is chosen, there's one physical attribute that the book of Samuel highlights about him. Do you remember what it was? Tall. It was tall and good looking. Goliath comes forth. What's the dominant physical attribute of Goliath? He's tall. And so Goliath comes forth and basically says, you know, me and your best man will fight. And whoever wins, their people will dominate the other people. Well, what should the king of Israel, who is the tallest there, what should he do? Step up. Step up. Where do we find Saul? Hiding in his tent. Hiding in his tent. And a boy comes forward. Who is that boy? David. And what does he do? He steps up. That's right. And so right there in the Old Testament, you see the beginnings of of what Jesus says about the cup. Now, here's the thing with the cup. The cup is an ordeal. We saw that in the book of Daniel. David, in a sense, says, I'm going to take the trial. This is going to be trial by giant. And, you know, Saul tries to give him his armor, right? And David says what? Well, I'm not going to wear Saul's clothes in this battle. Because if he wore Saul's armor, what, in a sense, would he be saying? I can't do it. I'm representing Saul. He doesn't do that. He goes in as a shepherd. Now again, when you hear that, if you've read the Bible, if you've read Psalm 23, you know he's going in as the servant of the great king because he understands that the king of Israel is always only a shepherd. He doesn't own the sheep. And so David steps out and slays the giant. And now, if you're reading the book of Samuel, well, then after that, the stories of the, the songs of the women sang. And what, what, do, what are the women singing? Saul has killed his 
thousands. But David has killed his And then how does Saul like that song? He didn't like it too much. And then what does he want to do? Kill David. Here's the city of man. He wants to kill David. Because that's how the city of man works. Oh, but God is all over this. And God says, no, you're not going to touch my anointed. Try as you might. But then David gets these opportunities. Look at the whole book of Samuel. See, this, this is what you're doing to me, Lil. Um, David gets his, these opportunities to kill Saul, right? Will David do it? No. Why not? That's right. I will not raise my hand against Saul. I will not shed his blood because his blood belongs to God. So the only way I can shed blood is basically when it is in line with my mission from God. And David becomes king. And then, of course, you have the situation of Bathsheba and Uriah. And that's why that story is so significant. Because he sheds Uriah's blood unjustly. And then God says, I'm not going to take your life. And it's like, but your son's going to pay for it. Oh, now we're back to this story again. Because whose son, whose son pays for it in the New Testament? God's son pays for it. So, all right, let's pray. We're out of time. Lord, we don't really follow you freely until we know your love. And Lord, just as was true of Jerusalem, your church is a poor representation of your kingdom. Forgive us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to embody your kingdom in our relationships, in our behavior, in all that we say and do. Because, Lord, we've been given a greater revelation, that of your Son, whose blood was upon the rocks. And with his blood upon the rocks, we see your heart. Help us, Lord, to be like you. This we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> All your fault, Lily. Oh, Lil. Always her, her one last question. <laughs> you keep doing it, Lil.